that's it. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I was just fumbling with the mic just then. It's like that Bridget Jones moment where I spent half the time playing with the mic. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here because what's so exciting is to, if you like, explore how much brain research and neuroscience can contribute to questions that are traditionally not the preserve of brain scientists. How many brain scientists, any? One. Two. Okay, two against how many artists? There we go. Okay, brain scientists. I think you've lost out there. So, um, will the two people put their hands up, please forgive me if um, I'm saying things they already know, because I'm speaking to the vast number of creative people. Um, what we're going to look at is um, just how one would go about looking and studying, if you like, the bump and grind, the sludge of creativity. Because somehow it must be, you don't create it from the ether, or perhaps you think you do, but uh, somehow in the stuff that's between your ears, somehow that does something special. And what we're going to do, not until we get towards the end, is see just how far we brain researchers are towards answering this very elusive but fascinating of questions. Well, I thought I'd start by um, putting up two creative people, uh, George Bernard Shaw and Van Gogh, both, as it happens, uh, men in late middle age with beards, but I'm sure that's just... Uh, <laughs> not, not, uh, no, that's not the end of the talk. That's what you have to do. Perhaps that's a sad sound. But I, I particularly like this one, I'm sure, because he's got these piercing eyes, you know, and you wonder what's going on behind those piercing eyes, of which the work was just a pale echo. What's going on behind your eyes? You probably don't have piercing eyes, but you're right. What's going on in your head? That however articulate you are, however creative, however close to someone however musical you are, you can't convey what's going on. And perhaps it's how you see the world that makes it so special um, that you do try and convey. So what we're going to be looking at is just how far or how, how little um, we've progressed in answering this issue. Okay, so this is the brain for everyone apart from the two people who got their hands up. Um, and why I like showing this particular picture is um, you can see how it occupies the same universe as sort of nasal hair and earwax, and saliva, and tooth enamel, and all the other kind of junk that um, you're there in your, in your head and neck. And the story I like to tell, and I've told it often, so maybe you've heard of this, um, perhaps you've done it yourself, the two people with their hands up. Um, when you do a human brain dissection, you have to wear gloves because you need protection from formalin, which is a toxin, which uh, is necessary for keeping the brain firm and uh, deceptible. But I was wondering, when I first did this, as I put my hand inside this Tupperware pot, um, a bit wearing gloves, and held this brain, which weighs about three pounds, if I got a bit under my fingernail, so I wasn't wearing gloves, would that be the bit that somebody loved with? Or a memory? Or a habit? What would it be? And that's what really freaks you, actually, um, when you actually see this banal, sludgy stuff, same as saliva and earwax and so on, but at the same time, somehow very, very special. Um, this is how people like to think of scientists generally, I think, um, but particularly into the future. And the reason I put these two together is because we're talking about brains, and what I really want to emphasize and explore with you, because we are all looking at the cusp of this astonishing century towards the future. I'm sure many of you have kids, all too young to have grandchildren, of course, everyone. But um, what is the future for them? What kind of brains are they going to have? And, how creative are they going to be? And some people fear that this is what awaits us, that this is what scientists are like already, kind of metaphorically. But literally, this is what we're going to be like. Creatures that are perhaps efficient and ruthless in our intellect, but somehow devoid of all the things we put a premium on, devoid of emotion, of love, of, uh, of all that wonderful uh, lack of prediction, spontaneity, and uniqueness that characterizes um, each individual. So what we're going to look at is the future and also to explore how creativity may or may not be jeopardized or enhanced in the future, and try to place it in the brain. So where do we start? Well, this is going to be a very fast cooked tour of neuroscience. Most people nowadays will start with DNA. I like this picture because it shows how unspectacular it is. We always hear about genes and so on, but it does look a bit like cotton wool there. I think rather, rather attractive aesthetically, I suppose. The artists might like this. But, um, but you know, can you see there the gene for good housekeeping, or the gene for being witty, um, or the gene for all these highly sophisticated specialized functions that some of the more populist press would lead you to believe exist? The answer, of course, you can't. Is there a gene for creativity? Well, I imagine you might already suspect from that preamble my own views on this, but let's just explore that a little bit further. What does any gene do anyway? 
And this is going to be now the fastest neuroscience course in the country. Yeah. It will last for about um, 30 seconds. Yeah. Although, don't time me, but it's pretty much along those lines. So, okay, you ready for your course? Okay, here we go. So, you can do the same for me one day in art. We'll do the same thing. 30 second course in art. So, here we go. That was a great organization. We start with consciousness, which we've already mentioned, this inner world that makes life worth living, that no one else, but no one else can hack into. This amazing phenomenon that we take so much for granted. When consciousness goes wrong, we talk about depression or schizophrenia or anxiety, and these are syndromes. That's to say they are umbrella words for a whole constellation of problems and impairments in what we could call mental functions. Mental functions such as language, memory, vision, the kind of things that you see as a single unitary concept. But you would be wrong. Because something like vision, let's take something like vision, which I'm sure you think of as a single thing, a single phenomenon, in brain terms is divided up into, in the case of vision, as many as 30 different brain regions. And you may or may not be aware that the way vision works in the brain is that color and form and motion are all processed separately. And by a way that we do not understand, don't let anyone tell you understand, the so-called binding problem, somehow they all come together to give you a cohesive whole. Now we know this happens because of really interesting cases of stroke, one particular one in Germany, a Frau L, who had a stroke, so she could see color and form in the normal way, but she couldn't see motion. Can you imagine not seeing movement, not being aware of movement? It means you can't pour out a cup of tea, you can't cross the road across the cars. A very, very frightening experience, and we can only hazard what she must have been going through. Anyway, these so-called sub-functions, let's take the example of vision, are divided up among, in the case of vision, 30 different brain areas. So it is not the case that you have one brain area, one function. You don't have the center for this and the center for that. You certainly do not have, you do not have the center for creativity in the brain, any more than you have the center for good housekeeping. Okay, so brain regions then are like instruments more in an orchestra. That's to say, any one brain region will participate in a whole range of functions and any one function is divided up among a whole host of brain regions. So you can't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. There's a convergence and a divergence. Now, if you take one of these brain regions apart, then you'll have what I call assemblies, very large-scale coalitions of brain cells. And if you pull it apart further, you'll get isolated circuits of brain cells, or neurons. I'm sure you're familiar with that term. And if you take things apart so further, you're in a really destructive mood, then you get the basic working unit of a circuit, which is actually a gap, a gap between one brain cell and another. I'm sure most people have heard of the term synapse. And the way one brain cell communicates with another across this little gap is to release a chemical messenger, a transmitter, which then shakes hands in a molecular handshake with the next cell along, and then that releases the next signal. We won't go into too much detail, but in order for this little chemical messenger, the transmitter, to go across the little gap, a whole load of biochemical baggage is required large molecules, proteins, that will enable this transmitter to be made, released, and then removed from the site of the action. And all that biochemical chicanery is activated by genes. That is the end of the course. Okay. Now, you can see, I hope, how crazy it would be to ignore this nested hierarchy and to jump from a gene up to consciousness or from a gene to creativity. You have to literally put genes in their place, literally. I'm not saying they are not important. They are utterly necessary. When they go wrong, you have terrible diseases. <coughs> but on the other hand, the link between the terrible disease or the function is most usually very, very indirect. And you need many genes contributing in ways that we poorly understand going up through this nested hierarchy in order to <coughs> see a link. Now, to just uh, ram home that idea of how indirect gene activation is to final brain function. I love showing this picture of a Rube Goldberg creation. It's a self-opening umbrella, um, which, as its name suggests, opens automatically when it rains. You don't need your hands to do this, but there is a high price to pay. You have this strapped on you. So let's just walk through. Now, the metaphor I'm trying to sell you is that the rain falling is like activation of a gene, the umbrella opening is like consciousness. And now that you are experts in neuroscience, you can, I hope, see the correspondence of the, of the um, hierarchy. So let's go. 